Very good. Well, hello, everyone. Um, it's uh, good to be with you today. I'm um, Scott Stevenson. I am based out of the uh, San Francisco Bay Area here in California in the US. And um, just wanted to thank you for, for joining me today. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about a, a bunch of different things uh, as it pertains to watercolor. And um, what I want you all to know right away is that this session uh, is for you and, and, for, and for you to ask questions. So if, if you have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. And uh, my good friend Annie will be, uh, will be looking for them there and she will uh, find a good spot uh, for us to pause and then we'll get into some questions. Um, but um, I've sat through an, a, enough presentations to know what I don't want mine to look like. So um, feel free to uh, um, jump in and, and ask questions as, as, uh, as they come up. So a um, little bit more about me. I've been in the uh, art materials industry for 23 years. Uh, I don't know where uh, the time has gone. Um, but um, I first got started in art, uh, actually when my son was a newborn and he was a typical typical baby, uh, didn't sleep well at night. Um, and the way that I was uh, able to stay awake at night was with watercolor. So uh, at the time I was working three jobs. Uh, I was working with the US Forest Service as a firefighter. Um, I worked at uh, Boeing Fire Department where they made the airplanes. And if I had any time left, um, I worked uh, at a ski rental shop uh, on the weekend. So even though I had these three jobs, uh, I still had to find time for, for my wife to sleep every so often. So uh, when I would take my turn, I would take my son and I would put him in my left arm and I'd take and I'd have my brush. And, uh, and I would try and paint with my right hand. And I'm sure I made great abstract art back then because all my son ever wanted to do was, was to grab that brush from me. So uh, it was always kind of a story, whoa, don't, don't grab the brush. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, so as time went on, um, I was pretty happy with the watercolor that I was using. I think I was using like a 1299 set of Praying watercolor. And um, one day uh, I had a friend give me a tube of the Daniel Smith Mayan Blue. And I was just kind of wrecked after that because nothing, uh, nothing that, that those other colors could do could replicate uh, what, um, what that one tube of Daniel Smith could do. So I became one of these people who would uh, literally, you know, save every penny, nickel and dime to be able to afford his next tube of paint. And um, so you can imagine, you know, time goes by and I get a phone call from the president of Daniel Smith. Her, her name is uh, Catherine Taylor. And she um, she asked me, hey, how would you like to come join our team? And and uh, uh, and at, at first, I, I kind of thought it was a joke because I have uh, I have some really good friends, and and one of the things that that we do is that we prank each other every once in a while. And in the beginning, I thought I was uh, uh, it was actually one of my friend's mom on the phone who was kind of playing along with the joke. But somewhere along in the conversation, uh, the alarm bell started going off in my head, saying, "Well, what if this is her?" So, um, so immediately I said, yes, absolutely. I, I would love to uh, come to work and, and, um, and uh, join your team. And, and, and at first she said, well, you know, can we, great, can we, can we get you some samples? And I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. I would love some samples. And she said, well, what can we get you? And I said, well, I need them all. <laughs> And she she kind of laughed. She kind of laughed for a minute, and and then she uh, she said, "Well, I'm sure if you work it hard enough, um, you will uh, you'll you'll have all the tubes here pretty quickly." So uh, after that, I just started um, um, handling some of the sales aspects uh, for them, as well as um, at a certain point, I started doing uh, demos and presentations uh, for retailers like Above Ground. And um, as time went on um, in 2019, they made me uh, their brand ambassador, one of their brand ambassadors. 
And uh, that gave me the opportunity to uh, work with retailers all around the US and Canada, as well as working with watercolor societies doing uh, things like this, doing presentations and, and demos. So uh, I've been very lucky. I'm doing the job that, I, that, that I've always dreamed of and, and I enjoy uh, uh, the relationship that I have with Daniel Smith. And, and it doesn't hurt the fact that, that I was a, a user of Daniel Smith long before I was uh, a representative and brand ambassador for them. So uh, anyway, that's, that's a little bit about me. I'm gonna jump into a presentation here and give you guys some visuals. And um, let me get in here and there we go. Okay, so um, the Daniel Smith story starts long before um, really uh, 1993 when they first started to create watercolor. Basically, you know, it started with this gentleman here. His name is Daniel Smith. He's our founder. And he went and his first exposure to art was at the University of Washington in Seattle, where uh, he was working in the department where they printed the school newspaper. And one day they were standing around the printing press lamenting about how terrible the printmaking ink was and how cool it would be if somebody would actually make a better ink. So uh, they all kind of went around the room and, and nobody really had uh, or showed much interest in doing it. And then it came around to Dan finally and Dan said, yeah, absolutely, I'll give it a try. And uh, so Dan uh, went ahead and did a lot of research, um, found the best black pigment he could find and the best oil-based binder, and then brought it back to his parents' basement in Bellevue, Washington, where he, um, where he put the ingredients together and mixed them together as best as he could. And then he brought it back to the school printing press to give it a try. And um, they were all pleasantly surprised about how well this black ink uh, Dan had made was, was working on the press. So it didn't take long for the school art department to hear about this wonderful black ink that, that Dan was making. And if they would go ahead and, and make some of it for them, uh, make some of it for the, for the department. So Dan went ahead and did that and delivered the ink and they loved it. And then uh, uh, they came back to him and said, hey, could you make this in, in, in about five or six uh, other colors? And, and Dan said, sure, absolutely. I, I know where to buy the pigment. I know where to get the binder. So, um, so uh, this should be pretty easy. So he went ahead and did that and, and made the uh, ink in about five or six other colors and then uh, brought it back to the school. And then all of a sudden, Dan was starting to see uh, the, these large orders coming in for the ink. And he was, a, he was a little confused because when he looked at the school uh, catalog or the class catalog, he only saw that ink was really being used in three or four classes. So one day he was uh, walking back uh, to his motorcycle to head home and he saw a car in the, in the distance with its trunk open, and there was something kind of shiny and, re, and reflecting light. So it kind of caught his eye, and, and he started to walk towards the car. And the closer that he got, uh, the more that he recognized what was shiny coming out of the trunk of this car. Well, it happened to be the canisters that he was putting his ink in. So students were actually selling his printmaking ink out of the back of their cars and placing orders through the school. So at this point, Dan decided that, hey, uh, wow, maybe, uh, maybe I could turn this into a career and, and be a full-time paint manufacturer. So Dan went ahead and, and did that and got started. And he ended up uh, uh, quitting his job at the school printing press so that he can continue to take orders from the school as well as give himself time to be able to develop some other products. So the second product that, that Dan made was a oil paint. Um, it, was our, it was the Daniel Smith Original Oils and it was uh, uh, around for, for quite a while. And actually it wasn't until uh, just recently that, that Daniel Smith decided to discontinue it. But it wasn't until 1993 that Dan decided that he wanted to make watercolor. And, uh, and, but the problem was is that Dan 
uh, didn't really understand what, what a good watercolor uh, paint should look like. So he didn't know how it should feel. He didn't know how it should uh, um, last. He, he really didn't have any idea how to do this. So what, did he, what he ended up doing was that he ended up traveling all over the world and going to watercolor festivals like the one in Fabriano, Italy, and some of the others throughout Central Europe and in the Orient. So he um, took all of this information from the artist and came back home to Seattle, where he started to go ahead and um, try and develop his watercolor. So he did the best he could, and then he came back the following year and allowed these artists to try it, the one who gave them all of the inputs, and uh, the artists loved it. Uh, they started using it in their classes, started uh, giving them credit in their work, um, and then soon enough, uh, business had developed and it was starting to grow, and it got to a place where it allowed him to be able to expand. And at this point, he, he wanted to do something that was different that no one else uh, uh, currently has ever really tried before. And one of the things that, uh, to know about Dan is that Dan was, was always a, a history buff. So he, he would love to study uh, civilizations like the Plains Indians and the uh, Egyptians and all of these uh, ancient civilizations uh, to see uh, how they express themselves with color. So he would, um, he would spend a lot of time um, looking at these, so you see down here in the bottom right where it says ancient peoples, these were the, these were the people that really caught his eye. So uh, it was the Mayans, it was the Egyptians, the Incans, playing the Indians, uh, the Inuits. Um, and he, there was all of these examples throughout history where, uh, where these civilizations would use rocks or minerals to um, create paint. So for example, uh, you have you have uh, turquoise. Uh, turquoise. Uh, the Plains Indians would take turquoise and then grind it as finely as they could and mix it with animal fat, and then this became their war paint. The Egyptians were were oh, have had a history uh, millennia long uh, love affair with lapis lazuli. Uh, the Egyptians were, were master chemists, and, and they were also really good at being able to purify things um, because they understood how to moderate heat. So they could take uh, very raw pieces of, of lapis and be able to turn it uh, into pigment for paint. Um, of course, they could also use lapis for jewelry, but all of these wonderful examples uh, throughout history where these ancient civilizations would, would use um, minerals and, and rocks to be able to express themselves in color. So Dan wanted to make those available for today, but the problem that he had was that the methods these, these civilizations used um, were a little too primitive and couldn't produce enough product to really make it worthwhile in, in today's world. So he had to figure out a whole new process for that. And that process is what we call primitive. So primitive is short for primitive technology. So if some of you are, are familiar with our products, you've seen that word or heard that word uh, primitive here, here and there. And that word actually means primitive technology. So it also means that if, if you see a, a tube of paint with a P on it, that is an indicator for you that that particular color derives from a mineral. So here's a flow chart that kind of uh, shows you what it looks like from about 30,000 feet. And we're gonna kind of dive in and get, and get a little bit more granular with it. So like I said, if, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and, and Annie will go ahead and shout them out for you. So, um, so let's kind of get into a, a little bit more detail here about how this process works for us. So it all, it all kind of starts with this guy here by the name of Bruce, and Bruce is our full-time mineralogist. And the cool thing that he gets to do is that he gets to travel all over the world and visit with all of our mine owners. So he gets to travel to places like Brazil and Chile and Argentina and Australia and 
um, and really all points in between. And he gets to work with our mine owners um, to source our minerals. So what's an really kind of important to understand is that when Bruce decides to go and purchase mineral, he has to be able to purchase 15 years worth of product in advance and in 15 year increments. Why do you all think uh, that, why do you all think we buy so much at a time? Let's see, I'm gonna pull up the chat here so I can see it. Yep. So the first thing is consistency. Consistency is, is the most important thing to us. So I would imagine if uh, you folks, um, you know, we got you hooked on, on a color, right? And, and then suddenly it was gone in a couple of years, that probably wouldn't make you very happy, right? So, um, and consistency for us is, is, is important. It's consistency in color as well. So consistency really is uh, something that uh, we at Daniel Smith really strive for because it is uh, one of the things that that um, uh, people look for in a, in a professional paint that that uh, over time that there's not much change from from year to year. So when you have 15 years worth of product on hand, it helps to make sure that you're consistent from from year to year. So what's the second thing? Uh, the second thing uh, it has more to do about economics. So if you, um, and it's pretty obvious, if, what's, what's happening now with, with uh, both of our econ economies is, is pretty similar. And one of the things that's, that's happening right now is about um, how uh, costs keep going up and down, up and down. And, uh, and when you buy product, uh, that much in advance, it helps to keep your costs flat so that we don't have to have uh, constant price increases. The third thing uh, has to do really with, um, we just don't ever want to be out. We want to be able to keep supplying you, our artists, without having uh, any, uh, any disruptions. So even during uh, you know, the heyday of, of COVID, uh, when everybody shut down, um, what ended up happening with us is that even though our, our labor uh, was shut down, uh, as soon as that was able to come back online, we were, we were able to produce again. So, um, so uh, just a great uh, an example for us is, you know, is that we didn't really have any problems with supply. It mostly had to do with uh, the government uh, mandating a, a labor shutdown. So, um, so that was really, it's really important to us. We even have 15 years worth of tubes on hand. That blew my mind. Who has 15, who has 15 years worth of tubes on hand? I didn't know anybody that does that. So, but, um, you know, and, and honestly, I was kind of a little skeptical the first time I heard about it, but, you know, one thing, um, one thing that, that I know about our, our, our current owner, his name is John, and uh, John was very serious about making sure that uh, those three criteria uh, were, were met with us, uh, met for us, so that we could uh, survive kind of these, um, these, these uh, pandemic sort of things uh, that can happen. So any questions at this point? I'm looking at the chat. All right, so we'll keep going. So when we uh, go to make a batch of paint, uh, what we do is that we'll take that mineral and we'll break off a piece about the size of a watermelon. So we're gonna break off a piece that's about this big. And then we go ahead and, and we put it in our first mill, which is what we call a jaw mill. And what that jaw mill does is that it puts a gentle amount of pressure on the mineral and causes it to break and cleave. So here's a picture down here of what that, what that jaw mill looks like. So basically you're gonna put that watermelon sized piece in there and you start that machine and that machine puts gentle pressure on the mineral and it causes it to break into pieces that are about the size of your fist. So, you know, a piece about that size. 
So, and we'll probably get about 10 to 12 pieces this size. And then uh, once, we, once we have them in this size, we'll take it to our next mill, which is what we call a hammer mill, which is this one up here. So the way that one works is that there's a clamp that you can't see, you see the machine operator up there and he's holding on to a clamp and, um, and he's able to push the mineral inside of the mill there where the mill gently removes the part of the mineral that we don't want. So I'm gonna show you a piece of lapis here. And oops, let's go back show you a piece of lapis here. So do you see all the gray here? This is all product that we can't use. So we have to figure out a way to remove that and, and be able to keep the product that we do want. So we put those, um, we put those, those this size pieces of mineral in there and it breaks the mineral down and, and he's able to, the machine operator can move the mineral around to be able to remove the spots that he doesn't want. And then basically what we're looking at at that point are pieces of mineral now that are this size. So we're probably gonna get maybe mm, six, seven pieces this size um, out of that this size piece of mineral. So once we have it here, um, this is really where I think the miracle in, in our entire process is. So the whole, the, the whole premise around what we are doing is to take something that is very big and make it very small, but not lose what's uh, but not lose what's interesting and valuable about uh, about the mineral. So it could be the beautiful granulation that you see here with sodalite, or it could be the shimmer that you see here with kyanite. So the whole idea is, is to make the mineral small enough, but not lose what's interesting and valuable about the mineral. So, and at this point, this is where the magic comes in, because what we'll do is we move on to the next mill, which is what we call a ball mill. And it looks like this here. So down on the bottom, it's, it's a ball mill. And the way that this, this uh, mill works is that it tumbles. It's a cylinder that rotates. And then on the inside, there are about a thousand or so uh, silica uh, um, ball bearings. And what ends up happening is, is that you load the mineral on the sides and then the mineral tumbles against all of those uh, ball bearings and causes this to break down into something that is really, 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 really small. Basically, it breaks it down into what we call 40 microns. So 40 microns is pretty tiny. So a, a micron is, is a small unit of measure. So basically to kind of put 40 microns uh, in perspective, if you picked up a, a sheet of, of printer paper or copy paper, that is the equivalent to about a hundred microns. A uh, human hair is only 70 microns. So what this is breaking it down to is, is something that's half the, half the width of a human hair. But the crazy thing is we don't lose what's interesting and valuable about the mineral. So to me, this is really kind of where the miracle is in, in, in our process. So this is how we're able to take um, large pieces of mineral and, and make them suitable for watercolor. Is there any questions? All right, you guys are a quiet bunch. Okay, so now that we have uh, all of our uh, all of all of our mineral together down down to the size that we need it, um, we bring it together where our other ingredients are, and um, we only have three ingredients to our paint. So it's gum arabic. It's distilled water and it's the pigment or mineral. Does anybody know what gum arabic is? I'm looking, looking in the chat. Tree something, yeah. 
JT, you're right. It's it's absolutely Jenny. Uh, Jenny T, yes. It's actually a tree sap um, that comes from the acacia tree. So there's two spots in, in the world where we get uh, gum arabic. Um, so we either get gum arabic from the Sudan or we get it from uh, or we get it from Indonesia. So what's really cool um, is that the uh, gum arabic is only able to be harvested uh, from the acacia tree after the acacia tree has gotten to be 10 years or more. So if they try and take the sap from the tree prior to it turning 10 years old, they'll end up killing the tree. So they have to wait a, a very long time before they, they can harvest uh, the gum arabic from, from the tree. So let me ask you all this. Why would we use distilled water instead of tap water? Tap water would certainly be cheaper. No minerals, yes. So what sort of minerals can be in tap water? Uh, sulfur, mm, sulfur not so much, but the, the big ones are um, iron, calcium, um, those are typically the, the most popular ones. But uh, also, you know, here in, in the US, there's fluoride, and then there's also, uh, depending upon where you're going, um, chlorine. So, um, and all of these things um, are, are not necessarily uh, great for, um, are, are great for paint, but not in the ways that you would expect. So, all of these things that are in tap water. Uh, actually don't make the paint any less light fast or permanent. Um, but for us, it's more about consistency. So let me go ahead and, and go back here and I'll kind of show you what I mean. So if you look over here where it says distilled water versus tap water, if you look in there, you see all on the left, you see where it says tap water, you have all these different color dots. So basically what ends up happening is that when you have all of those things in your solution of water, it creates what you call variables. And variables are kind of the enemy of a paint man manufacturer that wants to be consistent. So um, since there's no way to control um, the, the amount of um, particulates, is kind of what we call them in, 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 our, uh, in our lab, um, it creates variables, and, and for us, it could, it could change a little bit how the color looks. So when you have all of those different things in your water, it tends to want to push the pigment particles further away from each other. Um, and that can cause uh, the color to change a little bit. But when you have distilled water, all of those uh, pigment particles are closer together and makes the paint look a little bit more concentrated and bright. But at the end of the day, the thing that we care about most is, is consistency. So um, by having distilled water used in our formulation, it allows us to make sure that, that we arrive at the same place every single time that we go to make a, a batch of paint. So now that we've got the three ingredients in there together, uh, we put them in our mixing vessel. And these are just like big pots that you would see in, in a commercial kitchen. Now, um, the smallest, uh, the smallest uh, vessel that you see there is five gallons, but the largest one that, that actually isn't pictured there that we use is 500 gallons. So depending upon what color we're making that day, if it's, if it's a color that's, that we sell a lot of, we'll make bigger batches of. So hence, we'll use a bigger vessel. And then we take it down to our mixing station. And uh, the picture of, of the mixing station there um, is uh, one that we actually have in our lab. And, but the one that we use on our production floor is much, 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 much bigger. Um, it's basically the same machine, but just on a much larger scale. So uh, when, when we use the one in our production facility, we end up raising that thing up 16 feet tall, and then we turn it on and it churns the paint at a really high rate of speed. Um, basically, 
uh, think about what you have when when you have when you're making a smoothie in, in, in a blender. So you put your ingredients in the blender and then you turn it on. What happens? Well, what ends up happening, right, is that it rises. And the reason why it rises is because you're injecting uh, oxygen uh, into your smoothie and that's what's causing it to rise. So the same thing happens during the paint making process. And um, two things happen that we're not really a fan of. Uh, one is that it obviously changes the texture of the paint to something that we don't want. Uh, basically it changes that texture uh, to something like that's like a heavy whipped cream. So, um, so not exactly great for, for paint. Uh, the second thing that happens is that um, it'll also, because there's air being, being injected uh, into the solution, it causes static electricity to build up and it creates things that are called agglomerate. So there's pictures, there's a picture down here and this circle where you have those overlapping circles, um, that's kind of what it looks like under a microscope. So basically you have those particles that are tangled together. And ideally we want them to look like uh, what you see down here on the bottom where the particles are, are all linear. And when it's in this way, uh, the gum Arabic is between each of those paint particles, which is the, which is the ideal thing that we want. So what would it look like? So what does an agglomerate look like? So let's say for example, um, there on the bottom in that bucket, um, you were to take a brush and you were to get a little bit of paint on your brush and try and brush out that color. Well, some of it would look fine, uh, but then in the same stroke, you could also see uh, almost like the color turning to pastel. And that happens because uh, those particles are tangled and, and not evenly distributed. So we have to figure out a way to um, break out, break up all of those agglomerates so that we can make the particles like what you see down there in the bottom. So we have a machine for that and that machine is called a dispersion mill. So um, the way this machine works is that it has uh, three, three cylinders and then each cylinder is spinning in the opposite direction. So cylinder number one is spinning clockwise. Cylinder number two is counterclockwise, and then cylinder number three is spinning clockwise again. So the paint is, is coming up over cylinder number one, and then it's hitting the second cylinder, which is spinning in the opposite direction, and it creates this tearing effect so that it tears apart those agglomerates and allows the gum arabic to get in between uh, each of those particles. And then the same thing happens as it comes up over cylinder number two and then hits number three. And that same tearing effect happens all over again. So uh, this machine is, is, is very common in the uh, paint making world. Um, basically every single uh, type of paint you could imagine is, um, uh, is um, put on one of these mills. Um, so the other thing that this mill does is that uh, since those cylinders are all very close together, it crushes the air out of the, um, out of the paint. And uh, it also allows you the ability to kind of adjust um, what the particle size of the pigment is. So the, the more times it, it goes around on that mill, uh, the finer, uh, the paint makers can go ahead and, and make the color. So here's kind of what it, what it looks like. So over here in picture two, that little triangle uh, that you see there in the center, uh, that is what we call the apron. So the paint um, starts on the far side of that machine and then it travels along and then it comes out on this size where uh, a gentleman or one of our workers will be there with a squeegee and then he will squeegee the paint into a bucket. Um, and at that point, uh, a chemist will come by and his job is to make sure that, that it kind of passes muster before it moves on to the, really the next category or the next uh, piece of the operation. So what he'll do is that he will do two things. He'll get a brush 
and some paper and brush the color out. And then number two, what he'll do is he has this little slide and he'll put a little bit of paint on the slide and then he'll scrape the paint out. And depending upon how far he can scrape that paint out, it'll tell him actually what the particle size of the pigment is. So if, uh, if those two things meet his satisfaction, um, the paint moves on. If it doesn't, then um, we'll continue to mill the paint to get it to where the, um, the chemist is okay passing it on. All right. Any questions at this point? Yeah, I have one. Go ahead. Do you think it's apropos to mix acrylics? I'm an acrylic artist with watercolor. Is there any deleterious effects? Uh, there can be because the binders are different. Right. Um, and I think over time, um, you're going to see some cracking, uh, probably on the gum Arabic side because the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the resin that's used to make, um, uh, to make acrylic paint uh, sticks better. So the watercolor uh, just won't um, last over time. It'll end up cracking. Any other questions? What if um, you use the watercolor as a background? Like sometimes you could put acrylic on your canvas, let it dry and put oil on top of it. But you use uh, watercolor on the watercolor paper and it's oh. dry, you can put the acrylic on top of it then? That might be something, that could be something to try. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have any definitive proof either, either way, um, if it works or it doesn't work though. So it comes down to, um, you know, really just experimenting on your part uh, to see how it works. All right, Stephanie. Um, hi, um, I just have a question about why do some colors granulate and others don't? Well, that's a great question that I'm gonna that I'm very close to getting into, and oh. I'll be happy. I'll be happy to. We're gonna get into the weeds on that. I'll probably tell you more information than you actually want to know about that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll so, wait. There. But yeah, hang on, hang on a few minutes, and and I'll and I'll get right to it. Okay. Uh, any other questions before I move on? All right. Okay, so uh, now that we have the, the paint to where we want it, um, we take it to the next part of the process, which is what we call, uh, which is kind of the tubing process. And here's a little bit more pictures of what it looks, what that dispersion mill looks like. So he's actually loading the machine right there. So once, the, once we're past that part of the process, uh, we go to our tube filling station. And this is the really the only automated part of our manufacturing process there is. So this machine, uh, its job is to go ahead and inject the tube with the right amount of paint. And then uh, as it passes through, there'll be somebody over there who will um, take the tube, uh, put a crimp in it, and then they'll also stamp a batch number. Uh, on that crimp of the tube. So the batch number is really important. So basically uh, that's a way, so let's say that you have a, you have a tube of uh, uh, Mayan blue, for example, say, say Mayan blue here. And uh, you love the way that Mayan blue uh, looks and uh, you went through it and then you want, went and bought another tube and started using it and you saw something different. Something um, wasn't making a lot of sense. It, the color just looked different. So what you could do is you could call Daniel Smith with the batch number and, um, and then they'll go ahead and grab what, what we call a paint out um, along with the tube and make sure that everything lines up. And then, um, then they'll compare the other one that you reference, and then they'll come back to you with an answer. So it could be 1% of the time where they go, hey, you know, you're know, you onto something here. Um, let us get into it and we'll get back to you. But 99% of the time, the conversation usually goes like this. Hey, um, um, Scott, um, we're looking at this and is it possible that your water was dirty? Or um, is there, was there something else in there? Uh, we don't see anything on our end. So basically 
the good news is, is that we keep exact records. We have paintouts going all the way back to our very first batch, and we're well over 50,000 batches at this point. So we're stick, we're definitely sticklers for um, for for keeping records so that um, if you are are one of our customers uh, has a question that we can answer it for you very definitively. All right. Okay. Go back in here. Okay. All right, so let's talk about some of uh, other things that uh, that are important to us. Uh, testing is very important to us. Um, and specifically, when we tell you that a color lasts for a certain amount of years, we want to be able to substantiate that uh, with testing. So we do that and we use a machine called a xenon fadeometer. So what a xenon fadeometer does is that it accurately tells us how long our colors will last when exposed to ultraviolet light. So uh, it's about the size of a, of a large refrigerator, uh, maybe a little bit deeper. And in the middle, um, there is a carousel, which kind of looks like this. So in the middle of that carousel, a rod comes down. And in the middle of that rod, there is a light bulb and that light bulb um, uh, projects a very, very, very bright amount of light. Basically, uh, it's able to replicate 120 years worth of light fastness in, whoops, in 16 days. Whoops, where'd that thing go? There it is. So, um, so we're able to replicate uh, 120 years worth of light exposure in, in 16 days. At the end of the 16 days, we take the paint outs out and then we put them next to a template. And then based upon the amount of fade that we see, that helps us to determine what the light fastness rating of our colors are, which, um, which we'll um, dive into a little bit when we get to the color chart. So that machine, by the way, gets so hot that if we didn't put distilled water down the center of it, the whole machine actually would just melt. So it gets extremely hot and that, and that bulb produces an extremely bright light. Any questions about light fastness? Ready? Okay. All right, the other test that, that we perform is, is with something that we call a photospectrometer. So a photospectrometer, what it does is it helps us to be consistent from batch to batch. So basically the way that it works is, is that machine is attached to a computer. And then uh, on the machine there, you see a black handle, uh, which is right here. And when uh, we wanna do a test, we'll pull that handle down and then we'll put a little piece of, uh, of a paint out there and close the machine up and the machine will actually uh, uh, shoot light into the uh, particle of the pigment and then it'll measure the, the light intensity on the way back and assign it a value. So let's say for example, uh, soda light here was a 75. So, every single test using the photospectrometer for sodalite has to come in at 74, 75, or 76. If it doesn't, then we actually scrap the entire batch of paint because if, if it gets to this point, the, the paint is not really salvageable. And uh, I get the question a lot as well, why would you get rid of it? You could, you could still sell it. And, and I said, well, the problem is, is that when you're a, a manufacturer who strives to be perfect and excellent and consistent, putting something out that is substandard is just not something that you do. So the good news is, is that um, really uh, we, um, we haven't um, had to really get rid of a batch paint in, in a very long time. Uh, matter of fact, uh, in my tenure, I've, I've only heard of it happening once. And uh, let's just say it wasn't a great day for the production folks. 
<laughs> anyway, um, question, um, Patricia. So her question is, light fasting school, why sell non-light fast pigments at all? Opera, for example, or sell them under different category, specific only for users intended for immediately digitizing their work and not selling originals. Um, well, um, AP, what we, we do have two colors that are fugitive, um, and they're the ones that most people think about. Um, you mentioned opera pink. Uh, opera pink is definitely a, a color that um, um, is fugitive because it, it originates from a dye. Um, so uh, we do have them. Um, and we, we also have different colors that have uh, different light fastness ratings. So when we get to the color chart, um, I'll break that down a little bit more specifically for you. And, and if I didn't get to your uh, answer here, we'll, we'll try again there. Um, all right. What do they, excuse me? Yes. My inquiry, what do they mean by different series? Does that feel something with the intensity or chroma of the color or the quality of it? Because some companies they have series. Well, there's ones. two different, there's two different terms there. So series, when, when we talk about series, series actually has to do with price. Um, we have different categories as they, um, are, or different, um, ranges. Um, it's a one through four system, and um, I'll explain that a little bit more when we get there. Uh, Susan, when you say from a dye, what does that mean? So um, there's two different ways to color paint, uh, Susan. You can, uh, you can either create paint from a dye or you can, you can create paint from a pigment. So a dye is, a, um, is not a light, fast, um, product. So um, dyes tend to or tend to be used when um, there is not a, a pigment that could be made to accomplish the same thing that a dye can. So the thing about opera pink is since it derives from a dye, it's able to have fluorescent qualities where you're not able to get a fluorescent quality out of a pigment. So you kind of have to draw a, a kind of a line in the sand whether uh, the product that's used to make paint uh, derives from a pigment or a dye. All right. All right, the granulation question. So um, granulation is this effect here. Oops, let me move on. Oops, there we go. All right, I'm gonna move out here and just show you a picture. All right, so this is sodalite. And um, we don't add anything to our paint to make it do this. This uh, actually happens naturally and we can make it happen with either a mineral or a pigment. So to get this effect, uh, what happens is, is that the mineral or the pigment, the specific weight of the particles are heavier than the gum arabic and distilled water that it sits in. So the particles want to flow down into the tooth of the paper and, um, and uh, flow towards the, the little, the bottoms of the nooks and crannies in the paper. And then the gum arabic and the distilled water want to float to the top. And when you have that scenario, it creates this textured effect called granulation. So, um, Granulation, we're, like I mentioned, we could get granulation out of a synthetic pigment um, or, a, or a mineral. So it all has to do uh, with the size of the particles. So, and, and uh, because we're, we're really into chemistry and things like that, um, we're, able to, um, we're able to manipulate the size of the particles to be able to make a color granulate or not granulate. Um, let me ask you this. Um, what can we use granulation for? I'm going to show you one of my favorite greens. This is green appetite. And green appetite is definitely one of the more heavy, heavily granulated colors in our range. Um, what could you use this color for? What sort of setting? Leaves, yeah. 
Fractures on rocks? Yep, absolutely. Trees? Yep. Rocks? Yep. All good. Absolutely. So the big thing for me is that uh, granulating colors do a much better job of articulating what nature can do than I can with a brush or a pen. So if I want something to, you know, if I'm really wanting to pay attention and make something look natural, I'm going to use colors that granulate because nat it naturally wants to do that for me. So I don't have to worry about um, being so detailed um, with my brush. I can just trust that that a color that granulates is, is gonna create that textured effect for me. All right, I saw a question back there. Um, Maria, when gum Arabic separates a bit from the pigment, does this affect the paint? Um, actually, it, it, it doesn't. Um, there is, uh, plenty of each of the ingredients to keep the integrity of the paint. Uh, one thing that, that I would recommend that you do is if you do see that start to happen, um, to go ahead and uh, get a needle or a toothpick and then put the toothpick or the needle in the tube and kind of give it a stir, uh, stir it for a minute or two, and then that should solve the, gum, uh, the separation problem with the gum Arabic. So the reason why that happens is uh, um, either uh, extreme heat during transport or, or extreme um, temperature differences, um, going from hot to cold to hot to cold, um, can sometimes cause that to happen. So uh, what I recommend uh, to minimize that is when uh, you store your tubes, that you store them flat, and then that you store them in a, in a place where there's not going to be much temperature fluctuation. So I know Toronto, that could be, could be kind of hard. Um, but um, this, uh, when you have those big extreme differences in temperature, it can change uh, the way that uh, uh, um, uh, it, it can cause the, the paint to kind of uh, separate a little bit. But I just want to emphasize again, it doesn't mean that the paint is, is bad. All right. Let's move on. All right, let's talk about quinacridone for a moment. So quinacridone uh, is a name of a family of pigment, of pigment. So, and what's really beautiful is that the quinacridone pigments have such a diversity of color where you can go from um, a very bright orange to um, a very um, bright pink and, um, and just really kind of a fantastic transparent pigment to work with. But let's talk a little bit about where it all comes from and, and get into the weeds a little bit there. Um, so quinacridone uh, is a Latin word. So let's break down uh, what that word means. Uh, who knows what quin means in Latin, the word quin? It means five, right? So quin means five, and credone in Latin means rings. So it means five rings. So if you go up to the top here and see where the word quinacridone is, um, and you look at the diagram, the molecular diagram down below, you see one, two, three, four, five rings. So that's where that word comes from. The other question I get a lot is, well, what is it made from? Well, interestingly enough, um, all of these um, all of these things that the quinacridone pigment is made from, you can actually pronounce uh, things like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen in these specific quantities under a lot of heat produces the quinacridone pigment. So that's what it's made from. The history of quinacridone uh, goes back to the 1890s where a German chemist uh, developed it by accident. Um, he never really thought to, uh, uh, to patent it, um, but it wasn't really made in mass until the uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, when a, um, when a fledgling um, uh, car manufacturer by the name of Toyota uh, 
placed an order with DuPont for a specific kind of paint. And that paint uh, was derived from the quinacridone pigment. Uh, the first color, quinacridone color that Toyota ordered was quinacridone gold. So, um, and those of you who, who may remember, you know, cars during that, that era, it wasn't really a high chroma gold, it was more of a muted gold. And, um, and Toyota was, was the first uh, to use um, quinacridone colors in auto paint. Um, Daniel Smith was the actual was actually the first manufacturer uh, to use quinacridone in watercolor. So a little bit of history there, and, and we actually have more quinacridone colors uh, than any other uh, uh, manufacturer to date. So we talked a little bit about um, what we could use or what I like about quinacridone. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, do you see, do you see granulation here? Nope. Yep. Jenny, you're absolutely right. Nope. There's no granulation. There's a reason for that. So if we go back to our diagram here and we look at the top and we look at those rings again, all of those rings have a lot in common. They're all the same size, the same shape, and the same weight. So none of them is, is either taller, smaller, shorter, wider, heavier, lighter, none of that. They're all exactly the same. So imagine for a moment that you had a jigsaw puzzle and what, what it would look like um, if all of the pieces were exactly the same. So what you would have is you would have these pieces that would actually come together and join it in a very seamless way. And then that's what happens here with quinacridone colors because uh, of the uh, likeness of, of all of the particles or all of the rings, it, uh, they come together in a very seamless way. And that's the reason why we don't see granulation with these colors. All right, any questions about quinacridone? I had a question like quinacridone or cobalt or anything like that. Is it and any more arduous to make some colors vis a vis the others? Like, yeah, uh, you know, cer certain pigments take, um, take more processing time uh, just because of their hardness, uh, the hardness of the pigment and, and the ability to um, um, get them to the uh, right particle size on the, you know, on the dispersion mill or the three roll mill. So um, certain, uh, certain pigments uh, take a little bit more time uh, in order to process, in order to get them to where we, to where we need them. Some are synthetic, you say, some are- Some, some are, are synthetic, gen. some are natural. Actually, the, the mineral-based uh, colors are, tend to have uh, a lot more machine time associated with them. Like the cobalt, so you go out and get literal cobalt as a mineral from the earth or wherever, I see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, cobalt cobalt's is is an interesting one. It, it has a a a um, harder um, it, it's it's a harder pigment, and it definitely requires um, more processing time. Um, it's similar to a uh, mineral in in that sense, where it requires uh, a little bit more than some other colors do. That drives up the price, I gather. Yes, um, more time on the machine, yeah, the more costly it is. Absolutely. All right, uh, a Pat Patricia. Let's let me get back here. Um, I noticed for almost all sky color blue pigments, they are granulating. Any way to get a smooth sky blue uh, that doesn't do this? Great for stormy skies, not otherwise. Uh, we do have a few uh, a few colors um, that do that do to that. We we just add a new one um, called uh, King's Royal Blue. And King's Royal Blue, I think, would be a great solution if you were looking for uh, a nice sky blue that, that doesn't granulate. Um, another one, I think, it, that doesn't granulate is uh, Magony's uh, Blue Hue, um, which might be another option for you. Uh, Numa, uh, the source of quinacridone pigments. So 
Um, there are uh, a couple different manufacturers of quinacridone around the world. So you, remember, you have to um, um, you have to you have to understand that there's a difference between a pigment manufacturer and a paint manufacturer. So there's a couple different uh, pigment manufacturers throughout the world. But um, um, if I told you the source of where we got them, I, it's probably one of those things, if I told you, then I might have to kill you sort of scenario. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Beth, uh, do the tubes say whether chemical or natural pigment? Um, Beth, yes, they do. So any tube that has a P on it, um, that is a clue for you that that color actually derives from a mineral. So we'll, we'll talk about that um, when we get to the color chart. And Dougal, if quin colors refer only to the chem structure, how are there so many colors? So that's a great question. So let, let me go back here into the diagram and I'll, and I'll explain it a little bit better. So do you see these lines that are on some of these rings? Uh, chemists are able to move these rings around and when they are able to move them around, it changes the way that light refracts. So um, think about a crystal for a moment. And if you change the angle uh, on the crystal, you see different colors, right? So it's the same thing here. So when we move those markers around, it changes the way that light, ref light refracts and our eye interprets it as a, as a different color. All right, last one, and then we're gonna move on. Uh, Brenda, do you make water soluble watercolor pencils? Uh, no, Brenda, we do not. Um, we are gonna stick with just being a paint manufacturer. All right, um, let's move on. Um, here's a kind of a view of all of our quinacridone colors, by the way. So you can kind of see them all, all kind of laid out. So I'm going to uh, get into our color chart next. And um, uh, it's really, I think it's really important to kind of understand our color chart as, as it will give you uh, clues um, to how to work with our colors. So um, I'm just gonna cover the layout here. So on the main side of the color chart, you are the, the big side, if you were to stretch out our color chart and hold it out like this. Uh, the main side, the color with the most colors, those are the synthetic colors. So we have a, a total of 100 and two, excuse me, 266 colors in all. Uh, 36 colors from um, that come from minerals. So on the main side of the color chart, you have the synthetic colors. And this is page two, and then page three. So those were all synthetic colors. On the back side of the color chart at the top, you have our primitic colors. So these are all the colors that are derived from a mineral. So, um, and that's where you will find, where you will find these. Down below the primitive colors, you have what we call our luminescent colors. So these are colors that are uh, interference, iridescent, or what we call duochrome. So what do I mean by a duochrome? So duochrome colors bounce between two different colors, depending upon the background in which they're applied to. So if you look here, uh, on the left side with uh, duochrome saguaro green, you see that when you put it on white paper, it has this very interesting granulating uh, brown. But then all of a sudden, when you put it on a dark background um, or over the top of uh, uh, black watercolor ground, you see something completely different. You see this green color. So depending upon uh, uh, the background and your perspective, uh, the duochrome colors will present you with two different colors. Here's a, a look at it um, without the tube there. So I get asked this quite a bit. So what's the difference between iridescent and interference pigments? So iridescent colors 
uh, they have mica and that mica is oxidized in, in a way that reflects light like a mirror. So uh, the light comes in, uh, hits the, uh, it, it hits the, the substrate and then the light comes back through the mica and the, and the mica returns the light like, uh, like the way that a mirror would or, or a reflection would. An interference color is very different. So an interference color, what it does is that that same mica is actually shaped in a way that's similar to like uh, the way a diamond is. It has, it has occlusions in it. So when light comes through the mica and then hits the substrate, when the light comes back through the mica, it scatters the light. And when that happens, it changes, uh, it, it, it changes the way that the color looks. So it, it could be that you see fluorescent colors. It could be that you see metallics or pearls. So depending upon the way that that mica is shaped, um, it scatters the light. And when, that, when it scatters the light, our eye sees something different. It sees a different color. It's all about that refraction thing. All right, um, any questions about those three things? All right. So let's talk about how to interpret all of this information. So every color that's on our color chart has all of this information in it. So it, uh, the first thing we show you um, where it says color information is just to let you know that all of the information flows left to right, okay? So um, all of the information, so, and you read it like a book. The first piece of information that we really give you is what the color is available in. So either it's gonna be available in a 15 mil tube, a five mil tube, a watercolor stick, or a half pan. So um, here's a good way to look at. It. So here on, on the left, you have a 15 mil tube. Uh, in the middle there, you have a watercolor stick, a five mil tube, and a half pan. So I get questions all the time about what a watercolor stick is. What is this? Um, you see it in our literature. And if you're looking on our website, you see these promoted quite a bit. And what these are, it's the pigment or the mineral and the gum Arabic, and then that's it. Um, there's no distilled water that goes into this. And uh, the reason for that is, is that we wanted to create something that was very versatile and very easy to travel with. Um, has anybody ever traveled with tubes of paint on an airplane? It's a lot of fun, right? You get to where you're going and, and then you, you take, the, take the cap off the paint and then suddenly you've got paint all over your hands. So what's really nice about these watercolor sticks is that they're dry, um, but they're extremely concentrated. So basically uh, one stick, is the equivalent to three full pans of watercolor, not half pans, full pans. So these are uh, extremely concentrated. Um, they're very easy to travel with since they're dry. And uh, another neat thing is, is that they, um, um, they could be used in, in a variety of ways. Um, uh, you could use them for detail and then you can soften them with a brush. Um, but the way that I really recommend using them is to take the paint um, directly, from, directly from the stick and then go to your paper and then you get basically the same uh, intensity as you would um, out of a tube. Uh, one way that I'm, I'm starting to learn how to paint with these is that I will go ahead and I will put them between my fingers like that. And then I will take my brush and then I'll take the paint and then go directly to my paper. Um, the other really cool thing too is, is that you can actually blend on the tops of the sticks and not, um, and not uh, uh, contaminate uh, the other stick. So really, really handy. Um, and yes, you could go ahead and, and uh, cut these and, and then put them in uh, half pan palettes or put them in um, any of your other palettes, you can do that also. But um, 
just very nice and easy to work with. Uh, you can also take them and shave them and, and put them, uh, put the shavings into a palette and add a little bit of color. And you can do it that way also. So, but very versatile and, and actually um, very economical too. Um, all of these colors are, are all a single price point. So meaning that um, all of the colors, all 62 colors that we make um, are all the same price. All right. Okay, let's head on back. Any questions about watercolor sticks before I move on? No question. Do you yes, recommend the double primary uh, palette or if you want um, more chromatic colors, you'd buy each color individually? Yes, absolutely. You would buy each color individually. Um, I believe we're going to be coming out with a set. Um, you know, that'll give you some kind of what we would consider to be essential colors. And then I think we're also working on on ones that um, are granulating, you know, like if you wanted something like a granulating color set, I think we're going to come out with something like that, too. All right, let's head on back. Okay. Uh, we talked about watercolor sticks. So our half pans um, um, are actually very labor intensive to make. So basically uh, uh, it's a three step process. So um, we pour the paint, um, basically we, we take the, the tubed paint and then we put it into the half pan. Uh, we wait for all of the water to evaporate out of it, and then we do it. Uh, then we do it a second time, and then we top it off um, the third time. So um, each uh, each half pan generally takes um, um, they usually take about three days to make, um, uh, just because we we need the water to evaporate um, before we add uh, additional paint over the top. All right. Um, Back to, the, uh, back to the color chart and understanding the symbols. Uh, the next piece of information is the light fastness rating. So I know we're gonna have questions about this. So the way it works is that we have a one through four system, uh, one, uh, basically one through four uh, Roman numerals. And any color that gets a one means that color is light fast beyond hundred years. Number two, if you have a two, that means that color is very good and is light fast for 100 years. Um, three is fair, uh, meaning that color will go 50 to 70 years before, um, before uh, starting to fade. And for us, any color that has that Roman numeral four means that color is fugitive or that color begins to fade within 15 to 20 years. So, any color for us that, that fades within that 15 to 20 years, we only have two of them in our range. So uh, we already talked about opera pink, but there's another color out there that is fugitive also. That's uh, kind of a middle of the road red, I would put it. Uh, anybody want to guess? There's somebody out there that knows. It's alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson is a fugitive color, which uh, kind of blew my mind at first. It was like, why would, why would my instructors tell me to paint with a color that's fugitive? That doesn't make any sense. So, but anyway, those are the only two fugitive colors that we have in our range. So, uh, and we discussed a little bit with, with uh, opera pink um, being, a, um, being a fluorescent dye sort of color. Um, but, um, uh, but here's the case with alizarin crimson where alizarin crimson does utilize an actual pigment that is not light fast. So it's, it's, it's very interesting um, as, as to why um, alizarin crimson would, would not be fugitive. Um, Nicole, uh, what about rose matter genuine? Um, rose matter genuine. So we ended up uh, discontinuing that color um, um, and we ended up synthesizing it to make it similar, but we use synthetic pigments uh, to make sure that it was light fast. So we have something that's very close um, to the original rose matter genuine, but we now have a light fast version of it. Good question. 
Um, Stephanie, what about permanent alizarin crimson? Is it a fugitive color? Um, as you might have suspected, um, that word permanent means that uh, we have synthesized actually three pigments uh, to make it very similar uh, to the original single pigment version of alizarin crimson that is light fast, isn't light fast, sorry. So we use three pigments that are light fast to create something that looks very close uh, to alizarin, the original version of alizarin crimson, so that we can give you something that is a light fast variety of it. Good question. All right, um, so that that deals with uh, the light fastness rating. The next piece here um, is really the staining ability of, of a particular color. Um, we look at it as either a color is non-staining or staining, and we have a system for that. Um, it's a one through four um, in, in just um, typical one through four, no Roman numerals. Um, so basically, the way that it works is, let me, and I got a diagram here to show you, here it is. So if you look at uh, cobalt violet here, cobalt violet is a non-staining color. So if you see that stripe uh, going through that, you see that we were able to um, basically uh, put a, a very clean uh, stripe uh, through that cobalt violet. Uh, we were able to pick up the vast, uh, the vast majority of it, actually. So in this case, this is what we would term to be a number one or a color that is non-staining. The second color that you see there is, is Hansa yellow medium. And uh, this is what we would consider to be a, a low staining color where we're able to uh, lift or remove color and it just leaves behind a glow. Down below it, you have indent throne blue, and this is a medium staining color. So this is this is where you know, as as artists, we really have to kind of start paying attention. And the reason is is that when you have uh, a medium or colors that have more staining ability, uh, it reduces your opportunity to be able to lift it. You know, either for uh, to create texture um, or to uh, fix a problem. So here is really when you get to a medium staining color is where you got to start really paying attention to, to what you're doing um, in case that you either want to lift or you want to create um, or, or you need to extract color. Uh, down below that you have carmine. Carmine is a highly staining color. So this is one of those situations where if you make a goof with carmine, um, yeah, you're going to have to channel your inner Bob Ross and uh, tell yourself that it's okay because you're never going to lift that color. It's literally like spilling red wine on white carpet. The second that it hits the surface, it, it immediately bonds to the fibers and doesn't allow you to um, pull the color up. Any questions about staining? Well, yes. Sir, um, maybe. Backtrack just for a moment. What do you mean by a fugitive color and why are there just a couple of them? So fugitive colors, um, what happens is, is that when colors uh, begin to fade um, quickly, so we would consider colors beginning to fade within 15 to 20 years to not necessarily be a good thing. So think for a moment, um, if you had certain colors that were rated at 100 plus years, and then you had a fugitive color, what would that look like over time? So that's the that's kind of the point of giving you uh, a, you know, kind of a light fastness rating so that it becomes a predictor about how colors will age over time. So when you have a fugitive color, that color is eventually going to fade out and disappear altogether. So not necessarily good if, if you are selling a piece of work and, um, and over time, certain colors still look bright and vibrant and then certain colors disappear altogether. So not necessarily, not necessarily good or, or um, puts you in the best possible light with somebody who buys your work. 
All right. Um, Stephanie, I believe we we covered alizarin crimson. Um, permanent alizarin crimson is light fast, so it's light fast beyond a hundred years. Okay. Good. Thank you. Right. Yep. Um, you do have a couple of pigments that are both staining and granulating. I forget what they are and why are they most often opposites? Plus some, plus some that are neither or not many. So all of these characteristics, by the way, you, you have to kind of wrap your head around the fact that, that each of them um, um, is independent of each other. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, 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 a episode of Seinfeld. <laughs> where where everything could um, where everything that that could be false could also be true so it's possible to have a a, a medium staining color and, and also have it be transparent so which is kind of like wow how do i wrap my mind around that so okay. you just have to think that all of these characteristics are all independent of each other all right Let's move on. Okay, um, let's talk about granulation. We, we discussed how it happens, but uh, we also do call it out on our color chart. So um, uh, either N for no or Y for yes in varying degrees. Uh, we don't have a one through four system yet for that. It, it can be, um, it's, it's kind of difficult to do that but at least we call out which colors granulate and which ones don't. So granulation, as you remember, was this textured effect. All right, um, transparency. Uh, transparency is really important. Let me ask you all this. What happens when you blend a transparent color with an opaque color? Whose nature is strongest? All opaque. The opaque, right? So, and that matters when you want to go blend in opaque colors with with other colors because the second you introduce an opaque color with, say, you know, one that is uh, transparent, you lose you you immediately lose all the uh, transparent qualities of that other color. So, under when you understand transparency, it it becomes a predictor of how that color is going to interact um, with others. So for us, uh, anything that's an open circle, that means that color is fully transparent. A half circle means that color is semi-transparent and a fully darkened circle means that color is opaque. So really, you know, giving you this sort of information is, is really just to kind of help you be more strategic about the colors that you have in your palette. That's really what all of this is about. So uh, with transparency, um, transparency was kind of a, a big one for me because um, sometimes I would go and, and buy colors and then I would take them home and be all excited and then I would blend them uh, uh, with, with another color or what I was strategizing to do. And then I would, was sometimes disappointed as, as to why, um, why it didn't turn out the way that I thought it was. And it had everything to do with the fact that I really hadn't spent much time thinking about how um, how different uh, different transparencies with colors would interact. So um, transparency is kind of a big one for me. And then anytime you see that P symbol on a tube, on a tube, that means that that color is derived from a mineral. So whenever you see a color like this, you see the P symbol. That means that particular color derives from a mineral. Right. Any questions about the color chart? Um, yes, hold on. Yes, all right, oh, go ahead. Can I, can I ask a question? Um, can we get the latest color chart from Daniel Smith? Yeah, oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, one with any, all the colors. Yeah, for sure. Um, we would love we would love to get you one. Uh, and anybody else that's on the call or on the meeting here, um, if if you're interested in, in a hard copy color chart, please go ahead and, and put your uh, address uh, in the chat or direct message um, 
uh, Annie or uh, Amelia, and then they're going to collect all of the addresses, and then I'll I'll get them shipped out. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for something in, in the meantime, uh, you could also go to danielsmith.com and you could download a digital version there. Yeah, I still like a hard copy. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Um, I, cool. use, um, I use, I uh, use actually, uh, I use, I don't know about you. Sometimes I would go to the store and I'd buy the same tube two or three times and then I get home and I'm like, why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> so for me, the color chart not only kind of helps helps me to educate myself about about the colors, but it also helps prevent me from from buying the same color all the time or over and over again. But uh, I, yes, feel free sorry, to go ahead and email Annie, and um, she's going to um, go ahead and and get a list together, and I'll send all of these out. Okay. How accurate is the color chart when it's printed to the actual tube of paint? That's a really tough one because you know what? Uh, even as advanced as color printers are these days, mm -hmm. um, it is still nowhere as good as as our as our eyes. So it takes a while. Uh, it's we're not there yet. So um, I would definitely leave room um, for the fact that our that the uh, color chart that our you know that the color shows. Um, could be a little bit different than what you see out of a tube, and it's it's just not something um, from a tech you know from a technology standpoint that we've been able to um, get um, things like printers to be as good as our own eyes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Brenda had a had a uh, had a great idea though. Um, we do make a a dot card that has all of our colors now. It's a two hundred and sixty six color dot card. Um, plus 22 of our gouache um, now. And to me, that's the best of all worlds because um, number one, you, you get to try absolutely every color that, that you have first before you make the big investment in the tubes. Um, it also becomes a, a really nice reference piece that um, I saw one person, what they did was that they three hole punched it and then they swatched out some color so that, so that they could see all of the colors. So when they had, when they were uh, interested in, in, in making a different palette, they could just reference that doc card and uh, the doc card became a really, really nice reference tool. Yeah, can you not um, make your colors more transparent by liquefying them or adding more water? I know with acrylics I can do that, but I use all of paint. You paste. can, yeah, uh, you, you, can, you can to a certain, you can to a certain degree. Um, that's the one of the nice things about watercolor is that uh, you get quite a bit of opportunity uh, to be able to um, um, dilute color down to uh, the shade that you want or the value that you want. Make it more or less translucent or transparent, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, one last thing about the color chart. And let's go back here. All right, so what I want to see is how well you all know this information. So what's the first piece of information that we give you? Uh-oh, he's asking questions, this isn't good. <laughs> Come on, somebody knows. Full Tube circle size. is- What it's available on. Yeah. Right. Nice. So this color, Aussie red gold, is available in a 15 mil tube and a 5 mil tube. What's the next piece of information? Light fastness. Correct. So that means that this color is light fast 100 plus years. What's next? Low staining. It's low Two. staining. So that's good to know. So um, if you wanted to do a lifting technique with this color, um, you would be able to lift a, a, a pretty fair amount of this, this color off your paper. Um, it would probably just leave behind just a little bit of a glow. And What's it's non-granulating. Non-granulating. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, it is a non-granulating color. And the last piece? Opaque. Transparency. Transparency, right. So it's yes. totally transparent. Yeah, so, it's not filled in. 
Mm -hmm. So what do you think these letters and numbers mean underneath? The colors that make up the paint. Yeah, it's the pigment information. Oh, yeah, okay, gotcha. So P always stands for pigment. The second letter is always the color family it comes from. So what do you think Y means? Yellow. Yeah. yeah. And then 83 means that this is the 83rd shade of yellow. Okay. So when you go to our pigment manufacturer and you... Um, um, and you and you look through their reference materials, it always goes darkest to lightest. So if we're talking about red, for instance, red is almost black until you kind of put it in the light and you see in the light that it has a tinge of red to it. But as each shade continues to go, two, three, four, five, it continues to get lighter. So in this case, pigment Y, PY, pigment yellow, means it's the 83rd shade. All right, what's the next one? Red. Pigment red. The answer. I was, I'm being silly. What is it? It's a uh, mineral and it's oh. red family. Nope. So P means what? Pigment. Pigment. And what do you think R means? It's, it's, it's a color family. Red. 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 So this is the 101st shade of red, okay? All right, what's the next one? Violet. Pigment violet, 19. So uh, 19th shade of violet. So these okay. three pigments combined together create Aussie red gold. So interesting. Yeah. Wow. I love it. All right. Okay, any questions about the color chart? Yeah. Or any other questions in general? Yeah, I have a question. Oh. Um, what, great. What I, love Oops, what I one love about... Okay, I'll go. Um, what I love about Daniel Smith is like the, the variety of colors and a lot of, like you mentioned earlier, the um, granulating. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's any kind of standout pigments that you could recommend that are fun, that Daniel Smith is maybe more known for that are um, granulating. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, where do I start? <laughs> I love, so I feel like I'm like, I'm looking at and what like the ones that I have that I love is like the lunar black, the moon glow, uh -huh. undersea mm -hmm. green. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to, yeah, if there's anything else. Well, you know. in, in a minute, in a minute, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my camera down and I'm going to, and I'll get into some of those colors maybe that you haven't seen before. Okay. Amazing. Great. Yeah, for sure. Um, let me look back through the chat. I did see something here. Oh, I could ask a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Go I think ahead. you had a word in to write to you. Uh, with the colors and the numbers, do they go up to a certain number? Are they standard? Yeah. Is there any standardization across the different manufacturers that are out there, or it's unique just to yours, each one that has a color number? Uh, that's a that's a great question, actually. Um, let me ask you this. Have, have you ever noticed, say, like the Daniel Smith Prussian blue looks a little bit different than the Windsor Newton Prussian blue, even though the pigment information is the same? I know they look all different, but is there an intent that when you have an 83, they're 83 similar within a variation? They're, what's what's really interesting, and this to me was kind of a mind blower the first time that I heard it, was that for every single one of those shades, there are subshades. So why? Why would that be? Why would a pigment manufacturer want to make subshades? Is that a well, question? Generally, generally speaking, they would like to have more than one customer, right? Yeah. So when they're able to produce subshades, they're able to tell paint manufacturers, hey, I've got this, um, I've got, you know, this color, you know, PY83, that's the reference, but I could give you your own take or your own shade on that particular shade. So think about PY83, there could be PY83 semicolon 10 or five or two. And each one of those subshades is slightly different than the parent number. So, 
what's the reason why they do that is that um, paint manufacturers kind of want to carve out their own niche because what's the number one job of a paint manufacturer? If they don't do this, they go out of business. So understanding that, is there a standard that you all try to match? That there is. Three so that eight? parent number, so that parent number, we're, we were talking about PY83. PY83 is, is a standardized number and it's standardized throughout the industry and it's designed to get you close, but then they give manufacturers uh, uh, the latitude to create different shades within those um, parent numbers. Does that make sense? It does. And is there somewhere you can go to actually refer to all the numbers that are there that companies use? Yes. Um, I think there's two different places that I would look. Uh, handprint.com, uh, handprint does, does somebody know if that still exists? That's where mm -hmm. I used to look for stuff. How do you spell it? Handprint. Like and J N D P R I N T and print. Thank you. Um, that's one place. Anyway, uh, okay. So answer your last, question. Sorry. Yep. As you answer that, and do the numbers go up to an inter infinity in a way, or do they stop at 200, 100? Like I saw you had 101. Uh, they go for quite a ways, and it's different um, based upon what, what each pigment manufacturer decides to do. So there's, um, I believe there's five pigment manufacturers in the entire world. So, and they all kind of try to create their own niches and be able to offer um, um, paint manufacturers uh, different opportunities. And yours is U.S. based? Uh, we produce in the U.S., but we get pigment from all over the world. Okay, so you use more than one manufacturer then? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. I do. Thank you. And sorry, I shouldn't interrupt you answering the rest of the question. That's okay. All right. Um, I'm going to paint out some colors. I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera down. And feel free to shout out questions if you got them. I'm just going to turn things around here so that I can show you what some of these colors look like. So the first color, the first set of colors I'm going to show you um, are from the our primitive collection. So remember, they come from minerals. Um, so the first color I'm going to show you is a color called jadeite. Let's see if I can get it up there close so you can see it. Yep, jadeite. And jadeite is a super duper heavily granulating green. It, it is a, um, it's like, deep sap green on steroids. It is strong, strong, strong. And um, I really love using it, um, especially for fall foliage. And what I love is, is just um, on its own, it's beautiful, but I can also use this color for, um, uh, for a lot of different blends. And it's, uh, it's really kind of fun to work with. See all that granulation there? Pretty amazing. So this is jadeite, and it actually comes from real jade. Um, actually, here it is right here. So this is jadeite right here. <clears throat> so that is jadeite. Next color is going to be uh, Mayan blue. So this was the color that I, that I really fell in love with when I first started using Daniel Smith. And it is a very, very lush blue, uh, very intense blue. Um, I like it for, for a, a variety of things. Um, I can take it and have it be a stormy sea or, or a stormy sky, or I can take a take a uh, quinacridone color and I could tone it down and, and actually make it into a really beautiful green. So, but this is Mayan blue. So the big question that I get is, is like, hey, um, you know, in the literature, I don't see a, a, a mineral for Mayan blue. And there's a reason for that. So the Mayans were, were really, expert pigment makers and and what they would do is that they would take clay 
and then they would mix it with um, really almost anything they could find that that would actually ooze a color. Uh, so in this case, for, for Mayan blue, they would take um, that same clay and then mix it with indigo, and it created this color. So when we talk about Mayan, it's, it's really talking about the process they used in, or, uh, to, uh, in order to make pigment. So Mayan blue, this was, this was, uh, was the first one that, that I got started with, and it, it's still one of my favorite blues even today. All right. Next color is red fuchsite. So red fuchsite um, is, is an interesting color. Reach over here. So this is red fuchsite here. This is the actual mineral. And it has, as you can see here, it has quite a bit of mica associated with it. So this color will actually shimmer a bit when, we, when I put it down. And you can kind of see it right away. Because when you, you put it down and then you put it to the light and then you start to see it dance a little bit. See if I can get the light just right. It's always a trick with these cameras. I'll show it to you a little bit later once when, when it's set up, but it's it's a this is uh, this color is called red fuchsite. All right, next color is amazonite. And amazonite's a beautiful color. So this mineral has actually has a really cool um, uh, history behind it. Um, this is what it looks like. And uh, the ancient civilizations believe that amazonite actually had healing qualities. So they would uh, rest amazonite on their sick um, specifically when they had a fever. And, um, and at first I was kind of like, mm, that sounds interesting. Um, but when I first picked it up, I kind of understood why this mineral always has a very eerie coolness to it. So, I mean, literally you could put this mineral on the hood of your car and, and, and full in, in full sun and pick it up and it'll feel strangely cool. I have, I can't explain it. I don't know why it does that, but it always has this very interesting coolness associated with it. So, but it also creates a, a, a very beautiful uh, turquoise color. Next, we'll do amethyst. So amethyst is a really, really heavily, heavy, heavy granulating purple. And it is very luscious and loves the flow. And it's also, uh, it's also a granulating color. And um, in some instances, it actually shimmers a bit. So when, we actually do use real amethyst when, when we make this color. So when, this they're, is, when they're heavy granulating, does that also because they're so hard and they don't become down as, as fine? No, we, could, we could absolutely, with enough machine time, um, you know, make it so that it doesn't granulate. Gran granulation for us is a tool that we can um, that we can control, actually. So you choose to make that one heavy granulating. We choose to make it a heavy granulating color. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that is amethyst. Uh, here's green appetite. So 
this color is very interesting. It, it act, it's actually kind of a two-tone color. It has a little bit of um, brown associated too, and you can kind of see it because here's the mineral. You kind of see that it has some brown associated with it, and it actually does translate some to the paint. I paint that out. I saw there was a question about paper and what paper I'm using. Um, the paper that I'm using is the Fabriano Artistico. And it is, to me, it's kind of kind of the best of all worlds. It has it has uh, the grant uh, the the texture that I like. Uh, and it's also the sizing is very consistent. Um, um, I've been getting a, a lot of questions lately about um, sizing and um, and me personally, um, I haven't always been such a fan of the Arsh. Uh, I love the texture, but for some reason I, I can't I can't seem to um, kind of square in my mind about the uh, about the kind of the the inconsistency of of the sizing. So, but I love using the Artistico because it's always it's always very consistent, and I know what I'm getting from from um, block to block. So, Green Appetite that that is um, that's one of my favorite colors. Um, it's also one of my favorite colors to blend with. Um, I have a color that I call Secret Sauce, um, but its real name is Quinacridone Gold. So, and the reason why I call it secret sauce is it doesn't really matter what I blend this color with, it makes it good. So it's literally the Frank's hot sauce of watercolor for me. So, but I, I love to take uh, uh, a little bit of Quinn Gold with this, Quinn Gold being a synthetic, by the way. And I'll take a little bit of Quinn Gold um, with, my, uh, with my green appetite. And I'll just pick up a little bit. And I get these beautiful, fall foliage colors. Right there. So Green Appetite and Quinn Gold are, two, are actually two of my favorites. Okay. All right, Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. So this is a very interesting topic. So Sleeping Beauty Turquoise uh, comes from the Sleeping Beauty mine in Arizona. Um, it's this one here. So, and what's interesting about this is the Sleeping Beauty mine actually stopped producing turquoise in the year 2006. So that mineral is, is very popular uh, with the jewelry industry. And um, they ended up mining that that particular mine so deep that they hit the water table and flooded the mine and the mine no longer produces turquoise. So the big question is, is what's gonna happen in the future? Oops, are you all there? Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> I got really scared there for a minute. I don't know. Um, let me back out of here. Am I in screen share? Boy, that's really weird. We can see you. Okay, there you are. I had a, one of those freak out moments. Like, did I just drop? <laughs> Sorry about that. So here is uh, Sleeping Beauty turquoise. So it's, it's a very beautiful muted uh, uh, turquoise color. Granulates a little bit. So that's Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. So back to my uh, comment. So we're, we'll have a, a real interesting choice to make one day when uh, we run out of our supply of, of mineral. And we'll have a choice either to go ahead and make it uh, as a synthetic um, and synthesize it, or that color may be one that uh, rides off into the sunset that we don't have anymore. So, but... I will say that John, our owner, is really good about finding pockets of product, and um, it's quite possible that that we probably have at least another twenty years of this. 
Um, he always seems to be able to find all of the all of the pockets around the world of product that we can buy. Okay, um, let's look at Garnet. So Garnet is a really deep, heavy um, Adobe, almost um, brick color red. Um, perfect for for um, kind of those uh, desert or, or or southwest views. But it's a it's a very deep deep red color. So this is actually garnet right here. Oops, other way. There we go. So that is garnet. So those are the those are some of the some of my favorite primitive colors. Um, let's look at some of the synthetics now. Um, I have a few here that I really like. Um, my favorite, of course, is quinacridone gold, but I want to show you some that I don't think get a get enough uh, get enough attention that are beautiful. And one of them is this color called rose of ultramarine. So it uses a a com. It's basically two pigments, but uh, the dominant pigment in here is PB twenty nine or um, or basically ultramarine blue. So what's really interesting is that this color, um, you'll see it, there's a little bit of separation and, you, and you'll really start to see the ultramarine blue kind of come through. And keep an eye on it as I put other colors on here because the more that this color sets up, the more that you will start to see some of the ultramarine blue kind of shining through. All right, we got a question. Um, what is a good resource to learn of the manufacturers around the world in history and production? Um, generally speaking, you know, most manufacturers are, are fairly open, uh, you know, about their paint making process. Uh, of course, there are trade secrets and things like that that they won't reveal. But um, in terms of you know where they source pigments and things like that, that's kind of one of one of those more closely guarded secret sorts of things. Um, but if you're looking for uh, um, more information about history and paint making and, and all of that, um, um, I believe uh, Handprint was a good one. And there's also, um, there's also a book out there called, um, I believe it's called Rare Earth. Um, you can find it on Amazon and it really, goes through a lot of interesting information about, um, about uh, basically the technology of paint, uh, where certain pigments come from, where certain, uh, certain minerals come from, a lot of great information. Um, I'll take a look at that. And if any of you are, are interested in, and I'll, uh, I'll send it back to Annie and um, she can give you the name of the book. Yeah. Okay, um, next color is um uh, let's do let's look at cascade green so cascade green is a beautiful color it's um internally it's called a co-precipitating color meaning that um it has two pigments associated with it and, and the pigments actually want to separate on their own a little bit so this is a really pretty color for, for um, um, adding some different values to a forest sort of setting. And when you look at this color, you can see how the blue, you can start to see the blue kind of along the edges kind of push its way out. But this is a color called Cascade Green. All right, green gold. So green gold, when I first saw this color, I didn't think much of it at first. When I kind of put it in my palette, I go, kind of looks like baby snot, ugh. So, but when I started using it, I actually became a big fan of it because it has this really beautiful luminance. 
um, that really kind of shines through. And um, it's become more or more like my spring green sort of color. Um, and it's also really, um, it's, it's, it's very amiable in, in, in the sense that it, it blends well with other colors, I find. But it's really beautiful. So you can kind of see that you can almost get that two-toned layer effect, depending upon how much pigment you have in your brush. Okay. Let's do one more synthetic. Let's do, let's do this color. I'm not gonna tell you what this color is. I just wanna show you it first. And it's probably the most reactive color that we have in our entire line. And when I mean reactive, um, just how it moves through water is very interesting and different. So I'll just go ahead and kind of do a little wet on wet technique here and get a little bit more. And then watch this. It is really spectacular in terms of how well uh, the color just seems to explode from your brush and flow. I don't know about you, but watching watercolor flow through water is kind of the equivalent of kind of like watching a fire in the fireplace. <laughs> but this color is called Bordeaux, and it is a very, very, very strong, potent color. Um, it really does a, um, um, a, a lot of fun things when, when, as soon as it hits the water. But this color is, is called Bordeaux, and it's extremely... It's extremely, extremely uh, reactive and actually very concentrated. A little bit of this goes a really long way. Quick question, what's the green color, the one you just did before? Green gold. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Sorry, what was the first color? The first color is Rose of Ultramarine. So now you can actually kind of see it. Let me get it up there a little bit more. Turn yeah. it a little bit. You can see the granulation of the ultramarine blue kind of shining through there now. See little specks of blue. All right. Well, we're we're almost uh, to the end of our our time here. Um, does anybody else have uh, any other I any other question. question? Yeah, go yes, ahead. You alluded to. Windsor Newton and some sort of numerical methodology. I'm just wondering if that could work to the detriment of a manufacturer because Liquitex uh, desisted in making watercolor a few years ago. They're just into acrylics, no longer make oil now. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's only the numbers that we give are only meant to be sort of a, a, a reference point. So. And, and the reason for for that is 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 really so that you know you have a not you have an idea on a color you know on a color wheel where the color lands. So can it be a disadvantage? I think there are some manufacturers that aren't as open, you know, with their, you know, kind of with you know where their pigments fall um, for one reason or another, but we do it because we feel it's 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 part of the process. It's 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 a tool that you have to kind of understand how colors will work when when you blend them with others. So that's can it be a detriment? Yeah, I guess it could be. But it's not. <laughs> All right. Andrew, why why these samples are called synthetic? So basically anything that we deemed to be synthetic is created in a, in a lab. Um, it's, it's, it's made, um, it's basically man-made. Um, minerals are, come from the earth. So, and that's how we, we draw distinctions. So anything that's made by man, we call synthetic. And uh, anything made from the earth uh, will determine, uh, determine as a mineral-based color. All right. Uh, 
RE painting uses specifically for Mayan blue, rose of ultramarine, cascade green, red fuchsite, uh, amethyst. So basically, you could use um, Mayan blue. I think Mayan blue is great is great for skies and seas, um, just because of the granulation gives you the texture that that we see uh, that we can see in water. Uh, rose of ultramarine uh, could be used for a variety of things, uh, obviously for florals and and things like that. Cascade green is great for uh, for forests and it can also be used for for water. Um, red fuchsia because it, it shimmers a little bit. Let me see if it's a little bit better now. Yeah, I can see it. So there's a little bit of shimmer with red fuchsia. And red fuchsia is that shimmer is really good for um, attracting um, attention, uh, somebody's uh, view or attracting somebody's eye. So it's, it's great as kind of like uh, a tool to be able to channel somebody's focus. Okay. Uh, the red synthetic, that is Bordeaux, kind of like the Bordeaux wine. Yep. Okay. Well, we've go ahead. We'll do one more, one more question. No, no. I'm just, I'm just wondering, just want to say this is fantastic. I'm so enjoying this. <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you. I appreciate you all showing up today. And um, I, I especially want to say on behalf of Daniel Smith, how much uh, we appreciate all of your support. Um, it's the reason why we do what we do. And um, um, the um, Annie made, uh, made, it, made it known to me that this, is, this was recorded. So you should be able to find this also on the Above Ground YouTube channel. So um, anyway, if there are no more questions, then I'm going to bid you all a, a, a uh, have a great weekend and hopefully I'll see you all soon. I have a question. First of all, Go thank ahead. you very much for all your efforts. I really appreciate that you guys are North American. Is yes. there any chance that you're going to be also either expanding or maybe already are? I'm familiar more with you as watercolors, but into inks because I find inks fascinating and I love using them in combination and alone. You know, it's really funny about our inks. Every, every, it never fails. Every presentation, someone always asks, are you going to bring the inks back? <laughs> Um, uh, unfortunately, it feels like at this point, you know, we're, those are going to stay in, in, in our past. So, um, but anyway, um, yes, um, there would be a lot of happy people if we made inks again. Can you technically use the colors you buy from you as in us, the, the buyer and make your own inks from them? Um, <laughs> it depends. Um, if you are, the original inks were made from an oil-based binder. Okay. So, um, you know, kind of the whole oil and water scenario, probably not the, not the best idea. Okay.